So I thought I'd kick this off by giving you a bit of background about how Vancouver Exposed came together. It's basically inspired by my blog, Every Place Has a Story, and uh, that started a few years after my first book, At Home with History, came out in 2007. And the idea behind that book was that a house has a social history or a genealogy, much like a person does. And it was telling the stories that happened inside the house. And uh, this is my first book, At Home with History. So back in 2002, I was a freelance writer, and as Michael mentioned, a business reporter. And I was reading this article in the Vancouver Sun, and it mentioned a guy called James Johnston. And James is a house researcher who lives in Strathcona. And people would hire James to research their heritage house, and he'd find out um, everyone who ever lived there and show how the, the house fit into the neighbourhood and into the history of Vancouver. And I think the article called him a house detective. Anyway, I thought, wow, what a cool job. And uh, I called up James and, you know, I said, hey, you know, I want to interview you about some of your projects. And James kindly took me on a tour of Strathcona and we'd be walking around and he'd um, point out a house over there that was a brothel and over here was uh, former bootlegger's house and over here was a Chinese sausage factory and this is where Katie Lang lived in the 70s. And it was absolutely fascinating to me. It was also the first time I'd been in Strathcona and I was just bowled over by these gorgeous, gorgeous heritage houses. And uh, so after speaking to, to James, I wrote up a, a number of articles and uh, I started lurking around in the bushes in, you know, these hedgerows in places in Shaughnessy and I'd look up and try to imagine what happened behind the doors in these mansions, you know, 50 years, 75 years, 100 years ago. And then I'd go off to the Vancouver archives and I'd research like mad and I'd find not much or certainly not, you know, anything very interesting. So I'd start with the stories and I really found that the most interesting stories to me came from areas like Mount Pleasant and the West End and um, Strathcona and, and even, you know, North Vancouver. And uh, so once I started sort of digging into these stories, you know, I found that Vancouver was just so fascinating. You know, in the last, or well, the first half of last century, there was just this seething mass of corruption and this kind of seemingly endless uh, uh, number of stories to, to draw on. And after At Home With History came out, people would send me things. You know, they'd tell me stories about, you know, great-grandmother who was a madam or Uncle Harry who was a bootlegger or some, you know, relative or other that was a corrupt cop back in the day. And, you know, I found out about legendary women that I'd never heard of. And when I got really lucky, people would send me photo albums, you know, photos from their family album that had really never been seen by anyone outside the family album before. And I, I get things like this. Now, this was from the Maeder family, and um, they were a family of bootleggers, and this was the family business card. And, and it was back, I believe, in the 50s. Um, I mean, how awesome. And now, some of you may know Anders Fork. Well, Anders, you know, comes from a line of, you know, huge, huge line of Vancouver people. And um, this was his, I can't remember if this was actually his great-grandparents or his great-great-grandparents. But here they are, and they're the Garden family, and they're outside their house that was on Thurlow and Alberni in 1894. And this is another one from the Forks family album. And here's Mary and William Garden. And they're off for a ride around Stanley Park. I mean, aren't they wonderful? This is 1891. And I've never seen bikes like this before. But things like, you know, this would come in and they were so wonderful and I had nowhere to put them. So I ended up starting a blog, Every Place Has a Story. And it almost became a repository for other people's history and memories and 
and photos and, you know, I'd start blogging every week and I, I got really obsessive about it. And about oh, four or five years ago, I realised that my blog was coming up to its 10th anniversary in 2020 and um, talked to Arsenal Pulp Press and it became the, the basis of Vancouver Exposed. Now, if you were hoping for a chronological talk about history tonight, uh, you're going to be really disappointed uh, because the, the book jumps around in bits and pieces. It's almost like a newsletter or a newspaper, I guess would be better. You, know, you can open it anywhere and, and hopefully not get lost. And Vancouver Exposed is basically divided into five sections and uh, five of them are directly Vancouver and one is North Vancouver because that's where I live and uh, it's got some pretty cool stories. And so I thought for tonight I was going to pick some of my favourite stories to talk about. Now, a lot of you will recognise this or at least recognise the buildings, but when I first came across this photo several years ago, I stared at it for a really, really long time. Like I recognised the Vancouver block and the clock, but I couldn't figure out these other really cool buildings and did a bit of research and, as you know, found that that was a Strand building and next door was the Burke's building and across the road was the second hotel, Vancouver. And this photo here became the, the background of the cover for Vancouver Exposed, which, of course, is a Burke's building in the 20th in the 1920s. And our designer, Jazz Welsh, went to that corner and as best as she could, tried to get the same photo of that corner. And you can see what she's done. She's kind of made a collage out of it all. And she's taken both of them and just ripped it together to give that sense of peeling back the layers because that's very much what we wanted to do with the book. The first story always also relates to the Burke's building. It's um, called We Held a Funeral for the Burke's Building and it's based on a story that Angus McIntyre told me um, a few years ago and also sent me some of the, the amazing photos that he'd taken at the time. And I just thought I'd read a, a little bit from that story. At 2 p.m. on Sunday, March 24, 1974, a group of about 100 people, many of them students and professors from the UBC School of Architecture, came together in a mock funeral for the Burke's building. Participants marched from the old Vancouver Art Gallery at Georgia and Thurlow, led by a police escort and accompanied by a New Orleans funeral band playing somber dirge. The mourners assembled under the Burke's clock, an ornate iron timepiece that stood more than 20 feet tall and for decades had been a local landmark and familiar meeting place. On this day, it was too late to stop the demolition. It had already begun, but not too late to protest what author and historian Michael Kluckner and others have called an act of architectural vandalism. The crew working on the new building across the road shut off the air compressors and laid down their tools. Reverend Jack Kent officiated, accompanied by a choir. Angus McIntyre, then 26 years old, grabbed his camera and rode his bike downtown to record the event. There was a gathering, a sharing of ideas, a choir performance and a laying of the wreaths. A small group of people wearing recycled videotape clothing put put hexes on new buildings nearby. As soon as it came time to return to the art gallery, the band switched to Dis Dixieland jazz and the mood became slightly more upbeat. And just like that, the beautiful old Burke's building, well, not that old really, it was only 61 in 1974, was killed off to make way for the Scotia Tower and Vancouver Centre Mall. This is one of my favourite photos. Um, these protesters at the funeral are wearing videotape armour crocheted out of videotapes, used videotapes, 
that an artist named Evelyn Roth had collected from TV studios and, and film studios. And I tracked her down. She now lives in South, or she did a couple of years ago, lived in uh, Adelaide in South Australia, and she was still making videotape clothing, although I don't know where she was getting them from now. It must be a bit difficult. And I'm throwing this one in because just such a beautiful shot that Angus McIntyre had taken. Um, so of Burke's, um, just shortly before we destroyed it. And now, of course, all these gorgeous heritage um, buildings are gone, replaced by <coughs> the Pacific Centre, the Black TD Tower and Scotia Tower. Yay, us. So another of the recurring themes, if um, you can call them that, in the book, are missing pieces of art in Vancouver. I'm always surprised and uh, a bit intrigued about how really large sculptures and murals can just get lost. This is a photo of Accension, and uh, it was in the Hotel Vancouver lobby, our current Hotel Vancouver. In 1939, the CNR commissioned a 12-foot sculpture on the main floor near the elevators from an artist named Beatrice Lenny. She was one of the few women sculptors in BC. It was finished in blue steel, brass and chromium. But when the hotel renovated the lobby in 1967, they lowered the ceiling and Beatrice's sculpture along with two elevators got walled up on the wrong side of the wall. Here's Beatrice in her studio in 1940s. Her father uh, was Robert Lenny, a barrister, and he presided over the Lenny Commission, which I found fascinating because that was the, the first um, commission to police corruption in 1928, of, of which I wrote about independently. And it's funny, when you start messing around with history, you find all these connections, don't you? It's quite uh, interesting. And this is a photo of the current Vancouver lobby, uh, which is hiding Beatrice's sculpture in a couple of elevators, courtesy of Murray Maisie. Now, some of you will remember the Alcazar Hotel. And if you've ever been there, it um, was there from 1912 to 1982. Two, you may remember this mural by Jack Shadbolt. Apparently it was over the bar. Do you? Anyone remember this? Okay. Um, it was before my time, so I never saw it. And, and this was another part of it, which it, it must have been quite spectacular to see. Uh, Jack Shadbolt created them in 1949, and they were called Cycle of Seasons. Well, the murals survived the hotel demolition, but their current whereabouts is a complete mystery. So someone's got them somewhere in their house. But I did find out what happened to the neon sign. Angus McIntyre bought it and took it home. <laughs> so that's good news. One, mu <coughs> excuse me, one mural that you can still see is an incredible mosaic created by B.C. Binning for the Imperial Banks. Um, at that point in the 1950s, it was a new six-storey mid-century modern building on Granville and Dunsmere Streets. And this is a photo by Selwyn Pullen, who took it in 1956. And you can see it's got this um, very prominent place above the, the tellers. Well, these days it has a less prominent place above the gift cards in Shoppers Drug Mart. But the good news is that it's miraculously survived all this time and you can actually go up to the second floor and get really close to it. You can even touch it, but don't do that. They don't like that. Um, but um, it, it's pretty exciting to be able to get so close and... The, the mural is made up of 200,000 pieces of Venetian glass and, and represents the province's booming resource-based economy. 
Benin created the, the mosaic, the mosaic, mosaic. It's hard to say, isn't it? Mosaic in Italy. Uh, it was five hundred square feet, and he had the pieces shipped to Canada in twelve boxes. He then reassembled it right there on the wall, just like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And on the right is the building, the mid-century building, and that's the building on the left that it replaced it with. It was the uh, original Bank of Montreal that was built in 1894. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about spite houses because I just love the sound of them. <laughs> I first heard the term spite house Oh, several years ago, and I thought it was a style of architecture, you know, like, oh, that's an Arthur Erickson house, and that's a Frank Lloyd Wright, Wright, Frank Wright, Lloyd Wright house, and that's a, oh, that's a John Spite house, but, but no, that's not right. It's actually much more interesting than that. Um, it turns out that a Spite house is a building that's um, put up to piss somebody off. Aren't they wonderful? Uh, it's just a, a permanent way to, to give the finger to City Hall or, or, you know, have the last word with that neighbour with the annoying dog or that Heritage Commission that's trying to force you into something you don't want to do. And there's tons of examples online. Uh, the first one I could find dates back to 1716 and it was a man who was upset by the small share of his inheritance on the family estate. It was in Massachusetts. And he built a house that was just tall enough to block the view of uh, his two brothers' houses. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, more recently, Stan Pike wanted to build a porch on his house in Georgia. And the local Heritage uh, Commission said, no, sorry, can't do that. So, you know, it wasn't in keeping with the period. So instead, Sam painted the house uh, bright green with purple polka dots. And uh, there wasn't a very clear photo of that, so I didn't include that, but it was quite wonderful. Now, Vancouver has its own couple of spite houses. Uh, when I was writing at Home with History back in the early 2000s, uh, I visited the late John Davis, and uh, you may know his amazing houses in Mount Pleasant on the 100 block of West 10th. And the Davis family started buying up heritage houses in the early 1970s. And instead of ripping down these Queen Anne and Edwardian houses from the early 1900s and putting up some kind of ugly apartment building, which was going on all around them, uh, they restored them with no help, by the way, from the city or anyone else. And, and John told me at the time they were seen as the, the lunatic fringe. And as we were walking down West 10th, John would point out you know, various houses, and, and this was one of them. And this was actually uh, some past owners that had found out what John was doing and dropped off this photo. Um, but here we are, and we've got two Edwardian houses that it, you can see are, are touching each other or almost, and it turns out that that was intentional and it came about as a result of a feud. Two women had come over from England and they'd had the house built at 150, right on the property line. I guess there wasn't a lot of building codes back then. But the next door neighbour at 148 was furious and he built his house right up against it so it would block the view from their bay window. <laughs> and, and it worked, still does, 100 years later. And our most famous spite house, can you guess? The Sam Key building in Chinatown. And uh, yeah, so back in the early 1900s, Chang Toy owned the Sam Key company. And one of his properties was uh, a building on the corner of West Pender and Corral Streets on a standard 30 foot lot. And the city decided to widen. Pender Street, and they expropriated part of his land. And that left Chang Toy with six feet of dirt. So despite the officials, he built a three-storey building that measured under six feet, with bay windows stretching out from the top floor. And it's been the Jack Chow Insurance Company, as you know, since 1986. Now, after the story came out on my blog about spite houses several years ago, John Balshaw sent me a note. 
And he told me about this house on Lakewood and 3rd in East Van that was a white house with red polka dots. <laughs> and he wondered if this was a spite house. And so I was intrigued and I jumped in my car and I, I drove over to take a look. And I, I knocked on the door and I was absolutely astounded to find Chuck Curry, who at the time was the executive chef at White Spot Restaurants. Do you remember those ads with the famous chefs back then? That was at the same time. And he answered the door in his, in his chef whites. I, I mean, he let me take that photo. Like, he's even got his name, Chuck Curry, o on his name tag. It was very exciting. And um, so he, he was he's very nice. He invited me in and, and gave me a, a little tour around. And I'm just going to read a little bit from, from that story. It's one of my favourites. Chuck Curry, who's lived in the house since 1989 and first painted the polka dots with marine paint in 1992, says there's no big story. His friend John was working for a painting company and his boss went on holiday and came home to find that his crew had painted his house with purple polka dots. Now, the owner wasn't amused, but Chuck loved the idea and he thought it was a great way to liven up his own neighbourhood. The neighbourhood, incidentally, is packed full of gorgeous old heritage houses and he's never had a single complaint. Now, this is Chuck, his quote. I still remember the first car that stopped and gaped. It was a cool fall day and the windows were closed, but my friend John and I could clearly see the drivers say, holy shit! <laughs> I had a sax quartet rehearsal here that Sunday and one of the musicians said he'd been talking to a friend in Toronto who asked him, say, have you heard about that polka dot house in Vancouver? That was five days after we painted it. <laughs> Over the years, Chuck has heard it described as a house with measles and two little girls from the neighbourhood thought it looked like a ladybug. Another benefit is the paint job seems to attract hummingbirds. Who knew? Chuck, who can rustle up a mean ravioli, he opened up the first Earl's restaurant in 1982, left White Spot in 2014, but he still lives in the house. He also plays and teaches saxophone and clarinet. He says the great thing about his house is that students find it easily. <laughs> and he's always coming home to find anonymous gifts on his doorstep, bowls, juice pitchers, coffee mugs, all with polka dots, of course. <laughs> This is a, another of my favourite quirky house stories. So, back in the late 1960s, CN Rail built the Thornton Tunnel, which goes from the south end of the Ironworkers Memorial Bridge into Burnaby. And the tunnel's three and a half kilometres, and it comes out at Dawson Street near the Costco. But because the tunnel was so long, they needed a ventilation shaft at the midpoint so someone came up with this clever idea to disguise the house as a residential home. Now, it's on a large corner lot, it sits about 45 metres above the tracks, and it's set in you know, quite a nice landscape garden. But instead of a kitchen and a dining room, it has these huge fans. And the house has been there since 1968. And when I first um, wrote something on my blog, it was funny. People had come up with all sorts of things. You know, they thought it was a safe house and someone else thought it was an animal crematorium. But, of course, it, <laughs> it turned out to be, well, I guess, in a sense, more interesting. I'd love to get inside, wouldn't you? I'd love to climb down and take a look. But first off, how many of you have heard of Van Tan? Really, is that all? I hope Zoom audience is doing better than that. Okay. How many of you have been up there to Van Tan? Wow, okay. All right. Um, I've lived in Lynn Valley for more than 25 years now, and I'd heard rumours for all that time, you know, about a nudist camp at the top of Mountain Highway. And I'd always thought it was an urban myth. But it turns out 
it's not. Now, the Van Tan Nudist Clamp, Camp Club, sorry, not a camp, it's a club. It has about 50 members and a board of directors, just like the Vancouver Historical Society, <laughs> except they, excuse me, <laughs> except their board meets in the nude. They even uh, have a float in the annual Lynn Valley Days Parade. And they host a couple of open houses in the summer, or at least they did before COVID. You may have to book an appointment, which you can do because they have a website. And anyway, a couple of years ago when I, I heard that it wasn't a myth, that it really was just at the top of my street, really, uh, I fired off an email to Daniel Jackson, who was their PR guy, and you know, he invited me up there to spend a summer afternoon. And not surprisingly, the, the nudist camp is quite secluded. And this is Daniel and his partner, Vanessa. And on the day I went up there, they met me at the first late locked gate. So if you drive up Mountain Highway, you get to the park and there's a locked gate. Uh, then you drive about two kilometres up a really curvy, bumpy road. And it, it's shared by a lot of really determined hikers and mountain bikers and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and then you get up there. And this is kind of my photo of the view. It's my house down there. I could see my house. Well, I couldn't, but I can imagine. And apart from the novelty of the club, I was really fascinated by the history. It was founded in 1939, which makes it the oldest nudist club in Canada. And back in the 1930s, the District of North Vancouver had surveyed all the land at the top of Mountain Highway all the way to the Grouse Mountain Chalet. And uh, they'd carved it up on maps in, into half-acre lots. And a Van Tan member had bought three of these lots and he'd sold them to the club in 1945. The club leased uh, another three lots from the district to maintain their privacy. And they bought another two lots along the bluff from a group called the Millionaires Club. Uh, I haven't been able to find out much about them, but these were their two blocks that they had just along the bluff. And I'm taking this photo from the bluff. It's really quite beautiful. And apparently they used it for clay pigeon shooting, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> and as we know, fortunately, the subdivision of Mountain Highway never took off. Uh, this is um, a copy of the newsletter from back in the 50s, the Sunny Trails newsletter. Um, there was no electricity, and there still isn't. Uh, the club's buildings uh, include a sauna inside a log cabin. There's a hand-split uh, cedar roof on top, and that dates back to the 40s or 50s. There's a shower, a, a diesel backup generator, a, a, a composting toilet, and propane heater. And there's a, a really big swimming pool, which they're not allowed to have a swimming pool, so it's actually this water conversion tank in case there's a fire. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and this is a page from one of their albums uh, they were kind enough to loan me. Uh, this came from the 1970s. So it was quite fascinating being able to flick through this and, and seeing how it had changed over the decades. So my guess would be the average age of the club would be probably mid-50s. And the number one activity is gardening. And, um, you know, after a few minutes of very intense eye contact, um, <laughs> it, it all becomes, you know, pr pretty normal. Um, and the nudity thing's a, a pretty small deal. It's really a, a bit like hanging out with a very nice middle-aged gardening group, actually. <laughs> now, this is one of my favourite photos uh, from Vancouver Exposed. And it was taken by John Dennison, and he was a photographer with the province. He took this in 1979. And there's just so much going on here that when I saw it, I had to find out everything I could about it. Now, this photo was taken at the Coach House Inn in North Vancouver. And it was the fifth year of the World Belly Flop and Cannonball Championship. Now, just imagine if a 
gust of wind had come past. Whoops! But this whole crazy event was invented by a guy called Tom Butler. And he was a, a former reporter turned PR guy. And he was hired by the Western Bay Shore to hype up their swimming pool in 1975. So he came up with the idea for this event and he enlisted the help of uh, Andre the Giant. Do you remember Andre the Giant, seven foot four? Yeah. Uh, he was a star attraction and, and not surprisingly, he won the event. <laughs> it moved around for the next four years until it landed here at the coach house and it was huge. It brought in more than 3,000 spectators and entrance from all around the world. US President uh, Jimmy Carter's brother Billy was one of the judges. <laughs> <laughs> and it was broadcast on NBC TV to more than 20 million people. And after I wrote about it on my blog, Trevor Rowe got in touch with me and he said, you know the guy that's belly flopping out of the hot air balloon? That's my dad. <laughs> it was Kamikaze Bill, he was called, and Kamikaze Bill was a logger from Bellingham. And Trevor, who, by the way, was only four years old at the time, but I guess there's some things that you just don't forget. But he remembers his dad stuffing weights in his shirt so he'd meet the minimum 250 pound requirement to, to enter this event. And after all this work, Kamikaze Bill just came in second. The, um, that year, there were 16 entrants and the first place went to 20-year-old Robin Gentile, who weighed in at a very impressive 300 pounds. Now, Robin was from Lynn Valley and he was a cook at Brownie's Fried Chicken on Lonsdale. And his photo appeared in newspapers all across North Vancouver. He became a celebrity. <laughs> now, the winner of the world champion belly flop competition that year was Christy Russell. <laughs> Christy was a 450 pound stripper who went under the name Fanny Annie. And she used to come up to Vancouver to perform at the Penthouse Club and also, of course, the World Championship Valley Competition. I don't know if you can read that, but it says, great food and I should know. <laughs> Best wishes. <laughs> Fanny Annie. Fanny Annie gave this fabulous photo to the IAC family who ran IAC's restaurant Casa Capri, on Seymour Street for a few decades. Anyone go there? Eat there? Oh, I'm so envious. I would have loved to have gone there. It just sounds amazing. And the restaurant closed in the early 80s and Rick Iasi was driving past one day and he saw all of these, oops, sorry, Owen, framed and um, signed uh, uh, photos of, from celebrities that had been there over the years and they're all out on the footpath waiting for the dumpster and Rick's, yeah, and Rick's oh no, and he gathered them all up and put them in his car and saved a part of Vancouver's history in doing so and uh, you know, Sonny and Cher it just goes on and on, there's so many many people that uh, came up performed at places like the Cave and the Palomar and then went to IAC's after and ate uh, IAC's, I think I've got a picture, yes I do, IAC's is the house at the left, it's just got a sign on the awning on Seymour Street and uh, IAC's figures prominently in my book Murder by Milkshake uh, because the Castellanis were very good friends with the IAC's and that they ate there regularly. Janine who was uh, the Castellani daughter and 11 at the time would tell me these stories that they would put it to bed in the basement on top of the illegal booze. So when the police came, they'd just see these children sleeping while all the family ate upstairs. But uh, for those of you that don't know the story about Murder by Milkshake, 
1965, Rini Castellani was a CKNW personality and he murdered his wife Esther with arsenic flavoured milkshakes so he could marry Lolly, the, the 25 year old receptionist at the station. And in my blog and later in the book, I wrote about a stunt that he did for NW called the Maharaja of Alibaba. And this is at a, a BC Lions game in the early 1960s. And apparently back then there was no promotion that was considered too outrageous or too racist uh, in the continuous quest for radio station ratings. And at this time, rival station CKLG had brought up Marvin Miller. Um, Miller was a star of an American TV program called The Millionaire. And he would give away money to people he didn't know. Uh, CKLG thought, wow, this is a great idea. Get a boost in ratings. We'll bring him up to Vancouver and we'll have him go around and hand out a bunch of cash, which he did. And ratings did very well. Uh, so CKNW needed to match this idea. So they decided that uh, Rini would dress up as what people would think an Indian prince would look like. <laughs> and he would pretend to be buying the province of BC. And on his way, he'd go to all these events like the Lions and to clubs like, you know, the Cl uh, Palomar and so forth, and he'd hand out cash. So, so after this, the book came out and, and the story on my blog, I got an email from a guy called Bob Scheel. And Bob's in the photo with Rennie on, on the right there. He played Oogie, his driver, because they had a limousine that they would drive around town in. And um, at, at that time, Bob, or Oogie, was a 23-year-old uh, junior promotions guy that had been hauled into this promotion. The Rolls-Royce was kept at Bob's mum's house on Granville Street. And it was owned by one of the station's owners, uh, Dr. Ballard of the Dr. Ballard's Dog Food Company. And they hired an off-duty motorcycle cop to provide an escort. And two women, you know the women that do the, the demonstrations in the supermarkets? Well, they hired them to be the harem girls. And they would all dress up every day and they would go out and do their thing. And they also um, had a, a room at the Western Bay Shore and it was all very fancy. And they, they did very well in the, the ratings. Apparently they were so successful that people started making signs saying, keep BC British. <laughs> this was back in the 60s, just to, to remind you there. <laughs> So when my first book, At Home with History, was published in 2007, I, I wrote another couple of books and it took me a while to realise that I'd gone from writing about Vancouver's kind of sketchy history and to writing historical true crime. And so when I wrote Cold Case Vancouver in 2015, I was really shocked to find that there are literally hundreds of unsolved murders in BC some that dated back several decades. I intentionally chose cases that weren't well known, uh, in which the victims had been essentially forgotten about by everybody except their family and friends. And I wanted to change that. I wanted to tell their story, not just the story of their murders. And I'd hoped that by doing this, new information might come forward that um, might help police uh, and maybe give them a tip or a new lead. But it didn't, and uh, unfortunately, all of them are still unsolved. The only one that's come close to being solved is the babes in the woods. Uh, this is the two little skeletons that were found in Stanley Park in 1953. And last February, we learned that they were Derek D'Alton, seven, and his brother David, six, who lived with their mother and older sister in Kitsilano. And this is not a good photo. This is the uh, handout that the police uh, gave out uh, earlier in the year. So I updated uh, the story of the babes in the woods in chapter one of Cold Case BC 
And I'll just take a, a few minutes to, to recap the story for those of you who aren't familiar with it or, or may have forgotten it, and just talk a bit about some of the developments it had earlier this year. So back in 1953, Albert Tong was working with a, a Vancouver Parks board, clearing land in a remote area of Stanley Park near Lost Lagoon. And he stepped on a lump that was buried under a bundle of leaves and heard a loud crack. As he raked away the leaves, he found that the cracking sound had come from a skull. And when he looked, he saw that the old fur coat that was covering what would uh, later turn out to be two tiny skeletons. Now, back in 1953, there wasn't much in the way of crime scene forensics and police arrived, counted the layers of leaves to make a guess to the number of years that the bones had been there, took a couple of photos, threw the bones and, and the rest of the evidence in a couple of cardboard boxes and the evidence consisted of the coat, what was left of it, a couple of children's flying helmets and the murder weapon, which was a hatchet. And they brought everything down to the city morgue. And even though it was difficult, and still is apparently, to determine sex from skeleton remains, and both of the skeletons were dressed in the remains of boys' clothing, the pathologist wrote down that it was a girl and boy aged between six and nine. And this mistake sent police down the wrong track for the next 45 years because they were searching for a brother and a sister. Now, the police theory has always been that the mother killed the boys and they most likely killed herself. And this was certainly plausible. You know, the, the years after the war were rough, especially on women and particularly on single women. Then as now, there was a housing shortage, high rents, and work for women was usually available only in badly paid retail jobs or domestic work, which didn't provide for their children. When I was researching this story at the Vancouver Police Museum, I found um, the, the annual reports from 1948, and it mentioned several murders that year, but three involved mothers and children. In two of them, a mother had shut herself in a room with a child and killed both of them by gas oven. And another case was a mother throwing her children over a bridge and then jumping off after them. Uh, they didn't bother to list suicides. There were probably too many, unfortunately. Anyway, the Babes in the Woods case went cold until 1996 when uh, DNA became part of the forensic toolkit. The uh, Provincial Unsolved Homicide Unit was formed to try to clear a backlog of several hundred unsolved murders. And Detective Sergeant Brian Honeyburn headed it up and he decided to take another look at the Babes in the Woods. He took uh, the remains, or he went down to the museum and got the remains from the cardboard boxes and took them to Dr David Sweet at UBC. He was a forensic scientist that specialised in DNA and he was able to remove the DNA from the teeth and discover that they were actually two boys, not a boy and a girl. And this discovery essentially threw out half a century of police work because most of the tips that came in, you know, you can imagine, oh, thanks, you know, we're looking for a boy and a girl. We don't, you know, not interested in two boys out in the garbage. Uh, but the ones that they could find, they reinvestigated. Sergeant Honeyburn thought it would be disrespectful to put the children's bones back on public display. And, you know, he was right. I remember going to the police museum back in the late 80s. 1980s, it couldn't have been open very long, and the skulls were on the actual skulls were on display. Although I'm not sure I knew that then. Um, but Brian, without the knowledge of his superiors, decided to have the bones cremated and buried at sea. He did manage to keep the skulls, fortunately. And while he had good intentions, this really set back um, the. DNA, because there wasn't enough. They're very fragile, very small bone samples, and it was very difficult to get a DNA sample, and they thought it was going to be impossible until about a year and a half ago, and technology had advanced to the point where they were able to get a DNA sample from the older skeleton, and uh, sequencing 
for, for, G, for genome sequencing and put it into the genealogy databases in the States, uh, specifically GEDmatch, which is the law enforcement database. And you may have done this yourself or known someone that's done this. You spit in a tube and you send it off to Ancestry.com or 23andMe uh, just to find out your heritage or maybe a lost relative that you didn't know you had. And it pretty well worked out um, the, the same way. And law enforcement has now identified a number of missing people and also captured a few serial killers through this. And the most famous being the Golden State Killer. Excuse me. The Golden State Killer murdered at least 12 people between 1974 and 1986 and raped another 50 women. He went undetected uh, until 2018 when police submitted DNA found on a tissue at a crime scene to GEDmatch. Genealogists found a dozen distant relatives and built a family tree, eventually narrowing the killer's name down to about 1,000 people. They looked for potential suspects, men around the killer's age who had connections to the crime scene, and they were able to find two. So they followed them and they found cast-off DNA from both of these men. And in 2020, they were able to convict Joseph D'Angelo, then a 17-year-old former police officer who was married with three children. Now, a similar process was used to identify the babes in the woods, except rather than try to find a killer, of course, they were trying to give the boys their names back. And by May 2021, DNA technology had advanced enough where scientists were able to extract that profile and upload it. Now, I knew from a couple of sources back in February that the genealogy company that the VPD had hired had names of the boys. And this was incredible, but that was all I could find out. So I was waiting around for the press conference with everyone else. And then I got a message from a young lady named Ellie. And she told me that a Vancouver police detective had been to see her mother and told her that her uncles were the babes in the woods. Can you imagine getting that visit? Anyway, Ellie and her mother had never heard of the Babes in the Woods, didn't know the story, and they'd gone online and they'd come across my podcasts and they'd got in touch. And Ellie, years back, had been flicking through the family album and she'd seen her grandmother with two little boys. One was blonde and, and one was dark. And when she'd asked her grandmother who they were, she found out that they were her younger brothers, David and Derek. Now, the story handed down to the family was that they were really poor and uh, social services had taken the two boys because Eileen, the mother, couldn't afford to look after them. And Diane, their older sister, would tell her daughter and granddaughter stories about having to jump out of the back door of buildings when the landlord had uh, come looking for the, the, the rent. And they, they moved around an awful lot, mainly around Kitsilano back then. And before Diane died in 2020, her daughter wanted to find out more about her heritage. So she took a swab from Diane and sent it off to, to my heritage. And Ali decided around the same time that she would search for her great uncle's because, you know, they'd be in their early 80s and she was hoping to find them, you know, still alive. And if they weren't, maybe find their children or grandchildren. So she spit in a tube and she sent that off to 23andMe. And then things moved really quickly. So Ali had sent me a, a number of photos from the, the family album of her great uncles and her grandmother. And one of the photos was of Derek, and it was taken in 1947, shortly before he died. And he's standing outside a class at the Henry oops, Hudson Elementary School, where he went to school. And it would have been probably 1947 that the class photo's taken, and probably shortly before he died. <coughs> 
And police have always believed that the boys were killed by their mother, who then covered them up with her coat. But when I talked to Cindy, who knew her very well, she didn't believe it for a second. She told me that her grandmother was a, a lovely, gentle woman. She loved animals, babysat little kids, and was often very sad. And rather than kill her children and kill herself, she lived until 1996 and died at the age of 78. So on that cheery note, I'm going to... Oh, it's my office assistant. He puts himself in every presentation. <laughs> Max, get out of there. Sorry. Uh, at that time, I'm going to leave it there and ask for questions. Thank <laughs> you.